everybody welcome back to our channel my name is Megan and I am doing the love there challenge it's a 40-day marriage challenge and it is by Alex and Stephen Kendrick and today I am on chapter 31 and it is love and marriage and it says a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh and that's Genesis 2:24. the verse of God's original blueprint for marriage his specific one man plus one woman equal one design was established at creation that's Genesis 2:24. verified by Jesus mark 10 6 through 9 and clarified by the Apostle Paul Ephesians 5:31. But for it to work as designed, it requires a tearing away and knitting together. And I underlined all that because I really liked it, so I'm going to repeat it. This verse is for God's original blueprint for marriage. His specific one man plus one woman e equals one design was established at creation at Genesis 2.24. Verified by Jesus, and that's Mark 10.6-9. And clarified by the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 5.31. But, for it to work as designed, it requires a tearing away and a knitting together. And please don't mind his rough look. It is quarantine, we're social distancing, and he's... Needs a bath. <laughs> yeah, I need a bath. Oh. <laughs> Let's give me a bath, Mommy. Okay, I'll give you a bath here after all this. Okay. Okay. It reconfigures existing relationships while establishing a brand new one. Marriage changes everything. And couples who don't take this leaving and cleaving message to heart will reap the consequences down to line when the problems are much harder to repair without hurting someone. And I said, I do go to my mom with a lot of questions and I've had not just David but exes who would like me to come to them and um, then my always my mom. Um, I, I do need to work on that even though I don't think getting her advice is a bad thing. Okay, next it says, Leaving means that you are breaking a natural tie. Your parents now step into the role of counselors to be respected, but no longer authorities to tell you what to do. And I also said, that's what I go to my mom for is counsel. Um, many newlyweds, however, have a hard time leaving their parents behind. Shh. Our parents may not feel ready to release a child from their control and expectations and fail to do their part in the necessary transaction. In such, such cases, the grown child must make leaving a courageous choice of his own. And far too often, this break is not made in the right way. The purpose of leaving, of course, is not to abandon all contact with the past, but rather to establish and preserve the unique oneness that marriage is designed to capture. Mm -hmm. Only oneness yeah. um, can you become. Wait, only in oneness can you become all God means for you to be. If okay, you're I'll too tightly, high, tightly bound to your parents, if they are your in-laws and are allowed to dictate and make demands. The independent identity of your marriage, the God desires, will not be to come to flower. You will always be held back, and a root of division will continue to seed up the weeds in your relationship. And I said, I think this is hard for a lot of parents, especially mothers. Okay, James, I need you not to do that. Okay, you need to lovingly tell them that while you are grateful for their counsel and prayers, they must give you and your spouse the space to freely make their own decisions. Even if they react with surprise or a sense of hurt, this is necessary step to help you move forward together. Courage and clarity must be gently employed to break your marriage free from any unhealthy attachment. Sometimes unhealthy ties that parents keep with their children are related to unfinished business. Dad may feel that an apology is still in order or a wrong is, hasn't been forgiven. Mom may fear that her grown child won't survive without her. They both feel 
They may both be feeling insecurity and adjusting to the empty nest. They may simply long to be thanked for all they've done or need assurance of your continued love. Regardless, the married son or daughter is wise to take his or her parents out for a meal or, written, or write them a well-thought-out letter to express their genuine love and grateful appreci appreciation along with any needed words of apology or encouragement. Just know that issues likely won't go away unless you do something. Your greater loyalty must shift from your parents to your spouse. It must also shift away from old flames and old friends to your mate. And I like that, so I repeated it. I said, or actually, I said, I think David has done a good job with this. He's in the kitchen. That's why. Um, uh, deleting some of his on Facebook. Okay. Everyone else must take a back seat and become prop properly emotionally distanced enough to give your union room to bloom. For without leaving... <sighs> You cannot do the cleaving. You need to joining of your hearts are required to experience oneness. Cleaving carries the idea of catching someone by pursuit, clinging to them as your new help and support. The union, this union, should form a oneness that can benefit anything else you do. This man is now the spiritual leader for all of your home tasked with the responsibility of providing for you, protecting you, and loving you, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And that's Ephesians 5.25. This woman is now one in union with you, called to help beautifully complete and uniquely support you as one who chooses to respect her husband the way the church respects Christ. And that's Ephesians 5.22-23. through 23. Both of you raise your marriage exponentially to value the more you realize whom you are to call the daily represent okay I bet they're having a hard time concentrating because of you little nugget you need to either be quiet or get down choose one okay however it's unusual for couples even Christian couples to think they know better than God does and ignore ignore his purpose for the union of the rose as he designed applying genesis 2 24 seems too foreign or difficult for them so they settle for worldly thinking and neglect the leaving and cleaving god intended they may sacrifice the oneness and strength of the most ultimate relationship of their lives to please others who are not a part of them. They don't realize that the more unified their marriage, the more fulfilled and stronger they will be to handle every other role and responsibility in their lives. Wow. It's extremely hard, of course, when the pursuit of oneness is basically one-sided. Your spouse may not currently be interested in recapturing the unity and purpose in your marriage that God has printed on its DNA. Even if there is a measure of desire on their part, and the issues between the two of you may be nowhere close to being resolved. But by praying for and prioritizing your mate above your other loyalties, by protecting your witness as a guarded th treasure, your marriage over time can begin to enjoy the majesty of unity that God intended. His decision to make you one, his marriage was intentional, beautiful, eternal, and can be anything possible. So cleave, wait, so leave and cleave and dare to walk as one. Okay, today's dare says, is there a leaving issue with your parents or someone else you haven't been brave enough to conquer yet? Confess it to your spouse today and resolve it to, to make it right. The oneness of your marriage is dependent upon it. Follow this with a commitment to make your spouse and to God to make your marriage the top priority over every other human relationship. Has this been a hard thing for you to deal with? How has it affected your relationship? If the worst offender in this area is your spouse with your in-laws, how can you lovingly move this toward a better situation? And I said, 
No, not for me personally. I look to my mom as a best friend, but not as much as David. If one person does know me better than I know myself, it would be my mom because she she's known me my whole life. <laughs> David is learning more about me each day, but he even admits that my mom can probably understand me more in some things since we are both girls. I don't think it will affect any of my relationships in any bad way. My mom understands I need to cleave to David, and it's definitely a positive for David and I. He will feel needed. Uh, David and I have talked about this a lot. He knows I always go to my mom for counsel, and we agree with all our situations. All right. Um, and then I, the little Bible verse that goes along with this says, May they all be one, as your Father are in me, and I am with you. And that's John 17, 21. And then it's also a girl named Paula said, We have learned so much about each other in these 40 days. We have learned to love unconditionally take time for each other and grow spiritually together all right that is all for day 31 and 32. again i hope that you could hear what i was saying and pay attention but mom life right 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 i love yeah, you I bet. all right now i am on chapter 32 and it is love meets sexual needs it says the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also to the wife to her husband and that is first corinthians 7 3. in marriage a romance is meant to be to thrive and vibrantly flourish both in the old and new testament command the beauty of sexual love within the context of matrimony the song of solomon for example though frequently misunderstood is nothing more than about God's passion for his people it is also a beautiful love story. It describes sexual acts between a husband and wife in a beautiful poetic detail showing us how each spouse can passionately love and cherish the other one in their romantic relationship. It, in some of his other writings, Solomon said, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. That's Proverbs 5, 18 through 19. Words like these, blessed, rejoice, satisfy, enraptured, vividly remind us that sexual intimacy is one of the God's greatest wedding gifts to be fully enjoyed on a consistent basis as a husband and wife. It is all about celebrating what God has so graciously given us to each other, the purity of being naked and unashamed, that's Genesis 2, 2 through 25, within the covenant of our lifelong commitment. Through the pleasure of physical intimacy, we experience a strengthening of our relational, emotional, and spiritual intimacy as well. Faithful love transitions into overwhelming joy, resulting in a deep, abiding peace that no other sexual relationship outside of marriage can ever produce. As part of one, our married union, sex has no cost, no guilt, and no regrets. This is why God approves of only one sexual relationship, one man and one woman who are married to one another, and why he has placed around it such loving, protective boundaries. By proclaiming that marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, that's Hebrews 13.4. God provides us with the only way to protect our moral purity. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 2. To protect our bodies physically. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Honor our spouse faithfully. Exodus 20, 14. And keep our sexual experiences glorifying to him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He is not limiting our enjoyment for protecting it and us. But we are weak, affected by our past, deceived by our culture, tinted by unholy desires. Some Christians secretly view sex in their marriages as dirty or shameful. Some are haunted and weighed down by the memories of immorality and adultery in the past. Some have given in to the destructive undertow of pornography, fueling their lust with man-made sinful alternatives to the pure, unpolluted, replenishing experience God designed our sexual oneness to be. 
As a result, many husbands and wives have grown distant from each other, allowing staleness to set in, pushing each other away, withholding something precious that rightly and exclusively belongs to their spouse. God established marriage with a one flesh mentality, Genesis 2.24. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own, his own body, but the wife does. 1 Corinthians 7, 4. You are one and belong to each other. You are the sole person on the face of the earth called and designated by God to meet your spouse's sexual needs. Sorry if you can hear my dog snoring in the background. <laughs> So stop depriving one another, the Bible warns, except by agreement for a for a time so that you may devote yourself to the prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 If your spouse comes knocking and requesting physical intimacy, your love should open the door and welcome them in. Sex or the withholding of it is not to be used as a weapon or bargaining chip. The heart of marriage is one of giving ourselves to each other to meet the other's needs. You have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6.20 God set his affections on you and has gone to every length to draw you into desiring him. Now it's your turn to pay the loving price to win the heart of your mate. Sex is one God-given opportunity to practice what the love dare entails. But in reality, it is even more than that. The greatest celebration of all time will occur when those who know and love Jesus Christ enter heaven to be with him forever. It will be the consummation of our covenant of salvation when the bride of Christ, the church, will finally be with her beloved Bridegroom, Ephesians 5, 21 through 32. Though heaven is not described as being sexual, God gives us a small taste of heavenly joy through the regular physical consummation of the covenant between a husband and wife. The temporary joy we feel during sexual climax should cause us to worship God with hope and anticipation of the greater imperial joys and will forever be ours in heaven and i think that's very powerful words so i'm going to say that again i really like this it says though heaven is not described as being sexual god gives us a small taste of heavenly joy through the regular physical consummation of the covenant between husband and wife the temporary joy we are we feel during sexual climax should cause us to worship god with hope and anticipation of the greater and pure purer joys that will forever be be ours in heaven so each time you consummate your sacred relationship as husband and wife remember that your union is, the, is a celebration of your marital intimacy and the grand finale of your mutual love even more importantly it is for the beautiful glory of your holy god worship him with your oneness for what he does and for the internal joy that's soon to come and today's dare says if all po possible, try to initiate sex with your husband or wife today. Do this in a way that honors what your spouse has told you or implied to you about what they need from you sexually. Ask God to make this enjoyable for both of you as well as a path together intimacy. Was this a satisfying experience for you? If it didn't turn out the way you hoped, what do you think is complicating matters? Have you committed this to prayer? If it, it was a true blessing for both of you, what can you learn from this for the future? And since this is a personal for me, between me and David and God, I am not going to talk about my there from today. So, but anyway, I do want to go on. Um, there is an extra part in the appendix in this book, and it says seven steps to better sex. Okay, seven steps to better sex. Your level of enjoyment during sex is much more about what is going on in your heart, mind, and spirit than in your body. Too often, we don't prepare ourselves emotionally, spiritually, and relationally for sex. Then we wonder why that act of itself is only marginally satisfying. Since our sexual relationship is found, found 
founded upon the strength of your commitment, love, and intimacy, it is important to get these three key elements right before you are physically together. When a husband and his wife surrender to God completely, know and love each other fully, and then give themselves to one another wholly, their intimacy and lovemaking launches to a new level of, inti- of enjoyment. And not only this, God is greatly glorified in the midst of it all. Remember the idea of intimacy means to be fully known and, and then fully loved. It requires you to both to first be honest and vulnerable with one another and then to fully accept and affirm your mutual love and commitment to one another. Here are seven steps to help you experience these God-ordained blessings in your marriage and also take your sex life to a much higher level. Each step will increase your intimacy as you go through these one by one. Number one, remove guilt. Anything weighing on your heart or your conscience needs to be resolved. So spend a few minutes in prayer together, getting completely right with God so that no guilt is corrupting or weighing down either one of you. Recommit yourselves to Him and to His Lordship over your lives. Number two, remove bitterness. Unresolved anger pours cold water on romantic fire. So in addition to getting right with God, also get completely right with one another, not allowing any bitterness to exist between you. This means spending some time asking, are you hurt or angry with me? This is, any, is there anything between us? Have I wronged you in any way and, made, and not made it right? Both of you must sincerely apologize and completely forgive one another of anything wrong that has come between you. In Ephesians 4.32 this is vital to bringing about true oneness and the coming union you both desire. Remove stress. Stress and worry distract our minds and weigh down our hearts. Pray for one another and for the things you have been worried or stressed about. Pray for God to intervene in your circumstances. Pray for the future of your marriage and for Him to protect, bless, and strengthen your spouse. God calms our minds through prayer, brings emotional peace, and interweaves our hearts together. Then number four, fill up with God's love. As you're praying, thank God for His love for you and ask Him to make you a channel of His love to one another. Pray also for God to fill you with His Holy Spirit that He will pour out His love, joy, and peace into your hearts and through you to one another. As Romans 5, Five and Galatians 5.22. Number five, overflow with thanksgiving. Gratefulness and selfishness both greatly diminish your level of satisfaction, not only in sexual intimacy, but in all aspects of your life. It steals the joy from any experience and makes you feel used and devalued rather than celebrated and built up. Proverbs 23, 6-8. Thanksgiving is a way to focus your mind on the positives about your spouse and increase their priceless worth in your heart and mind. So spend some time thanking your spouse for anything he or she recently done for you and let your spouse do the same for you. Appreciate and honor the contributions you make to one another's lives. 6. Poor L. Affirmation. Affirmation, sorry. Uh, not verbally, affirm your love and long-term commitment to one another. Encourage each other with the things you most admire and respect in one another, the qualities and uniqueness that just still attract you to this special person in your life. Cherish each other with your words and receive your mate's words of love and devotion for you. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, the Bible says, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones, Proverbs 16, 24. Have selfish sex. Celebrate your oneness of God's gift of your spouse as in delight in your mate and become physical and intimate with one another. Both of you should focus completely on satisfying the needs and desires of your spouse before yourselves. Let your love unite in a feast of selfish affection. As you do, worship the Lord with your union. I have come into the garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my 
balsam. I hope I'm saying that right. I have eaten my honeycomb and honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. My eat friends drink and imbibe deeply. O oh, lovers, Song of Solomon, five one. All right, I will see you tomorrow. Okay, now we are on day thirty three, and it is love completes each other. It is if two lie down together. They keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? That's Ecclesiastes 4.11. In the finale of God's creation, he made the first marriage by taking one man, removing part of him, and fashioning a woman. In this mystery of matrimony, two could then come together and become one. Adam, though complete with God alone, found his God-given needs met even more fully with Eve, his Completement in life. This is true in your marriage also. Although love must be willing to act alone if necessary, it is always better when it is not just a solo performance. Our bodies, for example, are made for one of e made for each other. Our natures and temperaments provide balance, enabling us to, to more effectively compare Plead the task before us. Our oneness can produce children and our teamwork as a mom and dad can best raise them to healthy and maturity. Where one is weak, the other is strong. When one needs building up, the other is equipped to enhance him to encourage her. We can multiply one, one's another joys and divide one another sorrows. Two are better than one. The scripture wisely say, because they have a good return for their labor. For if if either of them falls, the other one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. That's Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. Your two hands don't just coexist together. They multiply the effectiveness of the other. And to continue succeeding at this level, each is not complete without the other. The Lord knew before you were born that you would one day marry your mate. And in his design of your gender differences, personalities, birth order, family origin, and uniqueness, he intentionally created needs in both of you that the other would be exclusively designed to meet. Although the differences can frequently be a source of misunderstanding and conflict, they have been created by God to be ongoing blessing if we respect them. One of you may be better at cooking, while the other is better at cleaning the dishes. She may be more gentle and able to keep peace among family members, while he might handle confrontation and discipline more effectively. He may have a good business head, but needs his wife to help him remember to be generous. When we learn to accept the distinctions in our mate, we can bypass criticism and go straight to helping and appreciating one another. But some can't seem to get past them. They can't tolerate their mate's differences. And they suffer many wasted opportunities as a result. They don't take advantage of the uniqueness that makes each of them more effective when including the other. One sex example from the Bible is Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who pres presided over, pres over the trial of Jesus. Unaware of who Christ was, he allowed the, the crowd to influence him into crucifying Jesus. But the one person who was more sensitive to what was happening was Pilate's own wife, who came to him and warned him. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Had nothing to do with the righteous man, for the last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. And that was Matthew twenty-seven nineteen. She was apparently a woman of keen discernment who grasped the magnitude of these events before her husband did. Granted, God's sovereignty was at work, and nothing would have kept his son from going to the cross for us. But Pilate's dismissal of his wife's intuition reveals an unfortunate side of a man's nature that is often downplayed. 
God made wives to complete their husbands. It gives them insight that in many cases is kept from their men. If this discernment is ignored, it is usually to, it's usually because of the term of the man making the decisions. When God looked at Adam and said, I will make a helper suitable for him, Genesis 2.18, the Creator knew what he was doing. He knew the men ne need help. Try, they try to function alone but consistently fall short. So a wife's title as helper to her husband is a high compliment, not a second class label in any way or criticism. In fact, God himself is referred to as our helper, and that is Psalm 124, 8. Jesus called the Holy Spirit a helper, John 14, 26. A husband who has a wife willing to help him fulfill God's assignments for his life has a priceless treasure. Marriage is one of God's unique ways of showing both men and women that we're not all significant in ourselves, that the effectiveness of our marriage is dependent upon both of the working together. Do you have a big decision to make about your finances or retirement planning? Are you grappling with the appropriate actions to take about a work situation? Are you absolutely convinced that your educational choices of the children are right no matter what your spouse thinks? Don't try doing all the analysis yourself. Don't disqualify, disqualify your spouse's importance in voicing an opinion on matters that affect both of you. Love real, realizes that God has put you together on purpose. And though you may wind up disagreeing with your spouse's perspectives, you should still give the views respect and strong consideration. The honors of God's design for your relationship and guards the oneness He intends. Join together, you are greater than your independent parts. You need each other, you complete each other. All right, today's dare says, recognize that your spouse is, is integral to your future success. Let them know to, today that your desire to conclude them in your upcoming decisions and that you need their perspective and counsel. If you have ignored their input in the past, admit your oversight and ask them to forgive you. Then it goes on to say, how did your spouse respond? What are some upcoming decisions you can make together? What did you learn today about the role of your mate? And I wrote, I found it ironic that this dare was today because we don't have dinner tonight because what we had for dinner last night was supposed to last us two nights. But it didn't. And David asked me what I was making for dinner. And I told him I was going to ask him what he wanted for dinner. Since I told him earlier that we had nothing to eat for dinner. He said he always has to decide what we're going to eat. And we don't have anything already prepared. I told him he is the man of the house. And he gets to decide. When I sat down to do this there, I laughed when I read it. I told him what it said. Um, it doesn't exactly go with what the dare says, but close enough. David said thanks sarcastically, I believe. And then a verse that goes along with this is, Put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. That is Colossians 3.14. And then a lady named Alice said, I feel like we are more in love now, more than just committed. Alright, that is the end of this video. If you like this, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that bell so you never miss any more of our videos. And if you missed any of the other ones in this um, Love Dare Challenge, um, I will have it linked at the end of this video. Watch out and for the next one. Alright, I'll see y'all next time. Thanks. Bye.